Welcome to today's webinar compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. All of our webinars are interactive. We encourage you to pose questions to our guests. The more challenging, the better. And the earlier you get the questions in, the better the chance of having them answered. The recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. Well, just getting the technic, uh, technical things right, and uh, well, what a pleasure to be with you again for the update of the share portfolio, the business share portfolio. Uh, just by way of background, we go through this in the next hour. I'll give you a little bit of an overview to start off with, and then it's, uh, it's to questions, and that's really the whole purpose of uh, these monthly updates, so that if you are replicating the portfolio, as many people do, um, we can then at least, or the reporter in me can then give you an update on what's been happening at those companies. But first up, our general manager, uh, sorry, our managing editor, Stuart Lohman, has uh, got his fingers on the technology, Stu. Excellent, thanks, Alec, always good to be here. Uh, just quickly, for those new to the webinar, there's a little control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. You'll see a little high five button there. If you can hear my voice nice and clear and see Alec, myself, and the presentation underneath those two videos, can you just give us a high five? Lovely stuff. I've got some high fives coming through. And as Alec mentioned, we do like to keep it conversational. It does give us a little intro and then questions. Please let them come in as early as possible because sometimes we do run out a bit of, out of time at the end of this uh, 60 minutes, which seems to rush by. But thanks, Alec. All looks good on the tech side. We're ready to rock and roll. Brilliant. And uh, I always put a covering slide to begin with, as you can see there. Uh, I think the theme of this month is that caution is working. Our caution is working for now. And what I mean by that is that we have a relatively high percentage of our portfolio in cash at the moment, is around 16%. Uh, and in the past month, it has not been a good month for markets generally, and certainly not for those that we're uh, the areas that we're invested in, yet the portfolio did pretty well. So, or at least held up, put it that way. Uh, and we'll go through all of the reasons for that. I think just to add to what Stu said, when there is a question, please just uh, just go for it. Let us know what's, uh, um, stop me as we go through it. This is not a formal presentation or death by PowerPoint. The slides are really there as a guide. And as you can see from the opening slide there, uh, what we are most proud of with this portfolio, which is going to be, uh, have gone for seven years in December. So we nearly seven years, six and six years and 10 months, is that the compound annual growth rate is over 20% in US dollar terms, um, more than 25% in rands. And that's really been a, an extremely good performance by any um, standards. And we'll explain what that's meant in just a moment. But let me get into the presentation itself. Here's the past month's movements. The big mover for us was Purple Capital. Uh, and the reason for that, I think, is the conclusion of the deal uh, or the sale of 112 million shares by uh, Mark Barnes and uh, the Ronnie Lubner estate uh, to Paul Rutherford, who's the founder and partner of Base Capital. Uh, Base Capital is a a private equity firm based in Cape Town. And uh, Paul has got a, a big following. Uh, people like him a lot. They like what he stands for and what he's done. And as a consequence, when he invests into companies, they're quite happy to go along with him. Uh, that's the, the first part of Purple Capital. And then in the last couple of days, I did try and get hold of Charles Savage, who's the CEO of Purple Capital, to find out uh, what the story was behind a SENS announcement on the 20th of September, just over a week ago, that a company called Gajoda, or an entity called Gajoda, has bought 4% of the company's shares. Uh, he was tied up this morning, and when I put the question of Gajoda, he didn't respond. So I must presume that it's, it's done because 
it is secret. <laughs> so, well, it is secret to us. 4% is not a huge amount of shares, but uh, in a company like this, if you're going to be buying the stock, it would help. And as you can see, Purple was our best performer in the past month, up by 11%. It is interesting that in the past month, they have also, this company has also concluded its BE transaction. And talk about a really good deal. A company called Seria Long, which was a BE entity, bought 11.5% of the Purple Capital shares by exercising an option to convert its 25 million Rand loan that was done in. 2018 uh, into equity in the company. They, the loan was struck at, or the conversion price was struck at 23 cents a share. And as you can see, it's at 160. So um, Bonang Mahale and his uh, colleagues in that BE consortium will be delighted with their little bit of business that they've done with Purple, which is now comfortably more than a billion Rand in market cap. Very happy with the company. It remains an exponential, one of the few exponential growth options on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and it is one that uh, has done us well in the last month. Another one of my favorites, anybody who's been following this portfolio over the past few years will know is Netflix. In fact, both of those, Netflix and Spotify, uh, were the two best, uh, next best performers. Both of them are uh, very specific companies. Netflix had its best run ever well, since it listed in 2002, uh, with 14 days of successive gains. It took it up to way over $600 a share. It's come back in the last few days, but it seems as though what investors like about Netflix at the moment, or like more about Netflix at the moment, is that there's an option uh, for it to, uh, to, to now profit from Apple being... Apple's decision, whether it was forced or not, is irrelevant, really, but its decision to allow other entities, other parties, to create paid-up accounts or paid accounts on the Apple in-app uh, uh, app. Now, I'll just give you a little background on this, how it works, is that when we put our app through, the BizNews app through to the Apple App Store, uh, we were specifically stopped from selling, for instance, premium subscriptions through the Apple App Store, uh, because at that point in time, when we put it together, it was not allowed by them. Well, they've changed those rules, and one of the beneficiaries amongst many is Netflix, and that helped Netflix's share price. Also, uh, there's a, 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 an analyst called Justin Patterson. Let's try and get hold of Justin Patterson at some point in time to find out a little bit more about him. Uh, he is from a company called Key Bank Capital, and Justin is being quoted quite a lot on tech shares. His target for Netflix, which has uh, got a lot of publicity, is $645. So at 583, uh, there's quite a little bit, but there's quite some upside there as well. Uh, the other boost, and you saw it really on a one day basis, was the news that Netflix has acquired the rights to screen all of the 180 episodes of Seinfeld. Uh, Seinfeld, one of the most popular comedy series uh, in history, and the fact that it is going to be bringing that to the screens has uh, has got particularly the Americans quite excited. It just, again, adds a little bit more value. Uh, it also bought in the period on the 21st of September, Netflix bought the Roll Dahl catalog. If you've seen the movies on um, Charlie, uh, with the Charlie Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and um, Matilda, you'll know that those are very popular amongst the, uh, not just the kids, but uh, adults of all ages. And that has been a help to Netflix itself. On to Spotify. Uh, well, there, the, uh, that analyst, Justin Patterson, uh, put out a, a note earlier this month saying it's time to buy the shares. His target for Spotify is $340. And as you can see, it's at 227 at the moment. So uh, quite a bit of upside potentially there. His whole argument is that like Netflix, Spotify has got considerable elasticity in what it charges subscribers. So on the one hand, its subscriber base is growing, but on the other hand, where the real bull factor comes in is it can increase its margins or grow its margins by charging a little bit more uh, for uh, two subscriptions. And there's an, a, a view 
that Spotify will be able to do that in the same way as Netflix can. The big news, though, as far as we're concerned, and we've actually backed the Spotify horse. When you have a look on Biz News and you uh, see where our podcasts are being promoted, uh, we went with Spotify, although we do also have it on Apple iTunes. And Spotify this month exceeded Apple iTunes for the very first time, which is quite an achievement given that it's only come to the game relatively late. It's now got 22.8 million subscribers. Apple iTunes has got 22 million, uh, and they are both way ahead of YouTube Premium, which has uh, enjoyed lots of support as well uh, from its parent company, which has got 15 million subscribers. And then also bucking the trend, which was a, a, a very bad trend uh, for tech stocks generally and for US shares as a whole. As you can see at the bottom there, in September or month on month uh, from our last webinar, uh, the S&P 500 index is down by nearly 3%. JSC is down by nearly 5%. So it hasn't been a good uh, t uh, trend for those shares. But in our portfolio, the one, another one that bucked it was Amazon. As you can see, that was up a little. It's um, It's got much higher recently. I've been seeing it at 30, 30, almost $3,500. Um, but uh, as we do the cutoff, of, as of last night, 3315 3316. Then having a look at those that came under pressure, uh, Apple, not surprisingly really, because it's the change to the App Store arrangements, which I mentioned about a, a little bit earlier, uh, has um, had an impact on the view of where Apple would be going. Apple did a heck of a lot though in the past month. It has had its annual launch of the new products. Now it's the iPhone 13 and the Apple Watch 7. Uh, what is interesting and, and good news for Apple shareholders is that the iPhone 13 has got a longer waiting list than the iPhone 12, uh, which is a good thing. They've also managed to keep the price constant, uh, but they've added new memory options, which will in essence raise what they get in, in revenue. So the prices for the basic model are the same, but People tend to, there's now one terabit uh, a memory option. It's incredible to think of that, but on an Apple iPhone. And the top end of the market will pay that a little bit extra. And of course, that will help Apple's margins as well. Uh, one little negative, one other little negative issue uh, is that the European Union is proposing to have a uniform a standard for mobile phones or for charging of mobile phones. And that would be different to what uh, Apple has got at the moment with its lightning charging port. I've got a brand new uh, Apple desktop, which I'm, it's just unbelievable. It really, really is unbelievable. It's not as big as the uh, the one I bought anyway. It's not as big a screen as the other ones, but it's, it's plenty screen, uh, plenty big enough. And the rapidity, the speed of it is just sensational. Uh, this is by using the Apple chips. The uh, They always used to get chips from Intel. Now they use their own chips. And uh, that's going to have a big uh, impact in time to come. The, the, the chips are certainly superior to Intel by quite some way. But what I, the mention, um, the one I wanted to mention here was that all of the plug-in ports are now on this lightning um, uh, connection. So it's a, it's a very different connection. In fact, maybe I won't show it to you now, but I th I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's the same connection that you get in in an iPad or the new iPads and the new iPhones and on their desktops. That's all they've got there. Uh, and the EU is saying, uh, we want to bring in something else. Obviously, uh, Apple's not happy about that. And they are certainly talking to the EU to see if if they can work around it. Uh, the 2U, which has been our disappointment in the portfolio, has come through a uh, a pretty rough time. Uh, in the last month, again, down by 6%. But some news that is being ignored, which maybe not too many people saw, was that the biggest hedge fund in the world, um, Bridgewater, which is Ray Dalio's fund, Ray Dalio, very well known, has bought into to you for the first time. They bought 133,000 shares, not huge, $5 million. But the fact that they bought a chunk of $5 million suggests that they're going to be buying more. Uh, the, the the upside on this one uh, that is being spoken about is uh, $75. That's the target uh, by uh, this time by Goldman Sachs. 
who have identified it as a, a good purchase. So I'm quite happy to hang in there and I suggest you would be too. Wilson Bailey, well, it, it came down a little on the JSE generally. Microsoft uh, fell on the overall uh, weakness of tech stocks in the United States and zero was down by eight and a half percent. I've had a look all over the place to try and find out why this would be. And the only thing I could come up with was the tech stocks in America, uh, in Australia rather, they have a, a thing they called the WAAX, W-A-A-A-X, stands for Wise Tech, Afterpay, Appen, Altium, and of course, X being for zero. Uh, it's, it's like uh, when we talk about the FANGs in the United States, uh, Facebook, um, uh, Alphabet, Netflix, and Google. Um, sorry, Facebook, a Apple, uh, Netflix, and Google. Uh, when you have a look at it in that way, um, it, it, it's their version, the wax, and that came under quite a lot of pressure. Uh, but again, Goldman Sachs rates this one a buy with a price of $165, and it's down to under $140, Aussie dollars, that is, at the moment. So not uh, not too much to worry about. Uh, in Australia, the feeling uh, that I could read in the various um, reports on the decline of zero uh, is that it's a result of all the tech stocks in in Oz being hit quite hard. So that's the that's the background to the past month's movements in the portfolio. Uh, the value, as you can see, um, has grown from around. 2.2 million rand when we started the portfolio. It's now sitting at 10 million, well, just under 11 million rand, uh, down 11, 1.1% this month. In dollars, we went from $200,000 and it's now sitting at $721,000, which shows you the power of compound interest or compound growth. Uh, in the last month, our portfolio did uh, was pretty resilient uh, compared with those numbers you can see there for the JSC and the S&P 500. The RAND uh, was steady. It weakened towards the end of the month. The RAND uh, being an important part uh, of this portfolio. It was started in 2014, December 2014, on the basis that we were worried uh, about RAND weakness into the future. That has eventuated, but not as desperate as, as might have been the case uh, that, that you would have predicted at that time, largely because of a commodity price boom that continues to this very day. And as you can see, the compound annual growth rate there, 20, 20, uh, just under 21% for the US dollar and just over 25% for the rand. What I did in this period as well, just to really a uh, bit of housekeeping, was go back into the portfolio and see, hang on, but what dividend receipts had we forgotten about? And it's quite interesting, since we owned Microsoft in uh, since we first purchased it, as you can see there on the 31st of August, its quarterly dividend has gone from 42 cents a US cents a share to 62 cents in the latest quarter. Uh, I haven't added that in there yet, but it will be coming through as 62 cents. Now, that's a that's a sizable increase, as you can imagine. You're talking about in a four-year period. Your uh, actually, I just grabbed my calculator out quickly. Uh, in a four-year period, you've got a 47.5% increase in the dividend payment. So sure, it's tiny compared with the Microsoft price generally. Um, uh, what's that? It's you know, it's not much more than 100, uh, $120 uh, where we started, sorry, $1.20, but it's now getting up to nearly $2. And suddenly, uh, that's the, the power of dividends. They're starting to become important. The $3,000 was added to the portfolio uh, and that get, brought the cash holding to $118,000. So it's not really uh, that relevant as you look at it. And most of the stocks in this portfolio are not dividend payers because it's an exponential portfolio, but it's a nice little addition uh, that we can get from uh, Apple and Microsoft uh, adding in their uh, dividends. There's the portfolio generally. You can look at it overall and peruse this graph in the uh, take a picture of it or have a look at it on uh, YouTube when the recording comes out and, and look at it at your leisure. But I think the important thing about this is the breakdown of the portfolio, that very last column, uh, where you'll see that our two big stocks, Amazon and Apple, between them make 43%. Uh, 
uh, it wasn't intended that way. They started off, both of them, at just 8% of the portfolio, uh, but they've grown because of their outperformance. Uh, Microsoft sitting at 10%. Uh, we pulled that into the portfolio later than Apple, hence its growth from 8% to 10%, and, of course, the excessive growth by, by Amazon and Apple. And uh, then Netflix, which is sitting dead on 8%, and, in fact, that started at, uh, life in the portfolio at only 4%. Zero has gone up from, uh, well, it's at 5% at the moment. Uh, very happy with that. Purple Capital has, has grown because of its 20% rise in SA uh, terms. Um, although it's, we've only had Purple Capital since April this year. Uh, Spotify, we bought in, sold, bought back in. Uh, if you will look at the net return from Spotify, it's significantly higher than, than that because we had a, a, a good, I, I, don't, I, didn't, I don't like trading, but in this case, uh, Spotify looked excessive to us at a point. Uh, when we were a little worried about the price of tech shares, uh, we sold it out and then it looked just far too cheap. And I love the company. It's a little bit like uh, Cloudflare, uh, which I'd love to add back to the portfolios. Now, coming back to the level uh, where it's looking very good value, again, in relative terms, a little bit like uh, zero. In relative terms, zero is still uh, very cheap. But if you have a look, sorry, not very cheap, it's good value. But if you have a look at it in terms of uh, PE ratios and things like that, uh, it'll drive you crazy. And then there, the the one poor performer um, in in terms of where we're sitting right now is to you, but I would urge you just to remember uh, that my track record on these things is that when I buy the shares, they take a little while to start uh, hitting their straps. So timing is not something that, that uh, I would ever suggest that I'm pretty good at, uh, but it is... If you can see that the stock is worth um, uh, holding in this portfolio, uh, then really just do that. Forget about it. Put it away. And in time, uh, enjoy the, the uplift. Uh, you'll see that there's still 16% of the portfolio in cash. That is a cautious position for us, one of the most cautious positions we've had. I'll be looking to add two new stocks in due course. Uh, but I haven't found them yet. I'm well, rather found them, but I'm not. I'm not absolutely certain yet. Alec, so, just on that, uh, I see Ed just wants to know if you've been looking at semiconductor companies. Not in great detail, Ed. No, I'm afraid not. It's a little outside of my my um, circle of competence. Um, I've been looking more at the 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 stocks that I understand a bit more about. Um, more media related uh, the uh, the twitter's one that i've looked at closely uh, peloton is another that i've looked at but worried about peloton um but certainly not uh, I, asml i need to do my homework on but you know what is a a good tip or a good suggestion is to have a look at the portfolios of those investors that you admire uh, and in that, for instance, uh, everybody's talking about the ARC funds, so there's no reason why you shouldn't go and look at Kathy Wood's holdings and then see where she is and look at the different companies that she's got in the portfolio and then to understand them better. But it takes time to understand companies. You, you can't just do it by reading one annual report. My feeling is that once one understands the, or, or, or you've read enough about the company, you then you then become a little bit of a, uh, a compulsive acquirer of further information on them. I've just uh, almost finished another book by Reed Hastings, uh, which is the Netflix management way. Uh, I like watching their quarterly investment uh, videos that they put out. It's that kind of thing. Once you become a co-owner in a business, it is on the Warren Buffett approach forever. So as a result of that, I'd like to know, or like to feel fairly confident that I know the company well enough when we do add it to the portfolio. And then I can actually talk on this monthly update. Um, and of course, I own these shares that we're talking about in my own portfolio. So these, this is where my own portfolio is invested in. But at least in the monthly update, I can come back and say, um, this, is the, uh, this is the performance of, this is what's happened with this stock over this period. Stuart? Just on Netflix, um, Alec, Paul just wants to know, he says, I see it's bought its first gaming company called Night School Studio. 
it says it seems like gaming subscriptions could be the next channel towards expansion for the company. Netflix is, is uh, you must be sure that whatever they do, they've thought about it really long and hard. And gaming is massive. Uh, my late son was, a, was an avid gamer. And he would often, you know, uh, nudge me and say, you should be buying, what was it, uh, EA, I think, is a, is a big uh, company in, in, the, in North America. Um, in, in that respect, though, I'd be very cautious about the gaming giant of the East, Tencent, because the Chinese government have come out and said the, that they're not prepared to allow their youngsters to have their minds uh, or the, the op it's like an, it's like opium for the minds uh, they say uh, the, the the Chinese government says and so they're trying to restrict the amount of time that children can spend on gaming uh, whereas in the United States there's no such restriction although who knows maybe in time that'll also come but I absolutely agree with you they've had a good run and it is a com it isn't it is a sector uh, that has expanded way beyond uh, anything that traditional investors in the past would have thought of. So it is another area to maybe go and look into. And if you're a gamer yourself, you know who the good guys are. And I often say that when you're investing into shares, try to buy into companies that you kind of understand and that you like. If you love Coca-Cola, for instance, uh, or Coca-Cola products, then Coca-Cola shares are probably something to consider. Uh, Investec Bank is a fantastic bank. That is a uh, perhaps an investment to look at, to go through their, their annual reports, have a look at the way they make their money and where uh, would you like to be a co-owner of that business and so on. And that's really one of the basics of investing is just know the business you're investing in or at the very least love their products, enjoy their products and you will then at least feel like you are part of their tribe and uh, if your share price doesn't uh, if the share price doesn't perform as well as you would have hoped well at least you know that uh, that, that they've still got a good product and uh, you, you're happy to stay with them uh, just with all the cash on hand Stephen wants Stephen wants to know if you've had a look at Shopify or Square well I know you have Stu Shopify what do you think of their performance <laughs> with our with our wine club no, well, from a technical point of view and uh, ease of use, Alec, I think it's a super smooth platform that takes away any barrier to entry for anyone wanting to enter the online e-commerce space. So from that point of view, I mean, I think it's a great company. I'm not sure on the valuations, et cetera. Though. But that's a very, very good place to start. So there's an example. So Stuart and Clive have been working together with Carrie and putting together the Biz News Wine Club. And they looked around the market. And they decided that Shopify was the one that they were going to use. Uh, and they do, uh, as, as Stu's just told us, they did have a, a, a positive experience from Shopify. So as a consequence of that, that's a trigger to now pick it up, pick up the annual report and start looking at the company and start following it and start understanding it. It's a bit like the way that, that we bought Amazon into this portfolio. You will recall Amazon at the time well, going back to whew, uh, the dot-com crash in uh, January 2000, Amazon was just way ahead of the game. It was only a bookseller at that stage, but I can recall we were looking at, uh, at MoneyWeb, my company then, at how we could enter into the e-commerce market. And we had lots of discussions with retailers, uh, a particularly a memorable one was with MassMart, the guy, a couple of guys from MassMart who were making some good uh, inroads into that area. I think it all disappeared after a, a little while later after the dot-com crash. But we were looking to find a way to sell MassMart televisions through the little tiny little business that we had, online business were, of MoneyWeb. But the getting the e-commerce right was such a hassle. It was going to be just about impossible. But now, of course, 20 years later, um, the e-commerce is slick. And as Stuart says, it's probably that barrier to entry, which was huge for us back in 2000, is now no longer a barrier to entry. And pretty much anyone can go in there. And what does that mean for Shopify's future? Well, if the product's good 
and the area that you're going into is expanding, then certainly it's worth investigating. So yeah, Shopify is one. Uh, I don't know Square. I'm, I'm not a, um, I don't know it. I haven't, I haven't looked at it. I haven't used the product. So I'll just uh, restrict my comments to Shopify. Thanks, Alec. Um, Vanessa just says, with IT taking strain, I know you did flag the dividend payers in the portfolio. She says, is it not time to maybe look at some other dividend payers? Yes, of course it is. It's It depends on your structure, on the structure of your, uh, um, or the reason why you've got the portfolio. Some people who are a little older, say 50 plus, will be looking to build themselves a dividend paying uh, um, a group of, of equities in their portfolio. And there's uh, the point I was making a little earlier about Microsoft is a case in point. Since 2017, their quarterly returns are up 47%, and that's in US dollar terms. So it's very, very sensible if you're looking at that as your priority, that you want to go into a stock uh, or you want to buy into a company that's a, already a dividend payer, it's got a lot of runway and it's going to be increasing those dividends into the future. That's a good place to start. What this portfolio is about though, is primarily to try and find exponential companies. Try and find the companies that are going to be enjoying outsized benefits from the, the, the seismic shift in our uh, economic system from the industrial age to what, well, the second machine age, I, I prefer that uh, Eric Bryn Johnson and Eric, um, Andy McAfee's book, when they spoke about the, the second machine age first, I really like that description. And then Carl Schwab, uh, Klaus Schwab rather from the World Economic Forum picked it up and he called it the fourth industrial revolution, which seems to be the one that's caught on. But it is that kind of thing. These are massive, massive changes. The, the mere fact that we can have this conversation with a hundred people, uh, on the webinar today, and you could be anywhere in the world listening to this, and and are I often after webinars I get uh, pinged by people in Portugal or United States or Australia. It was it was totally impossible in the past. Technology has made this possible, but what does it do? It it delivers a completely different outcome for people who are managing their who are managing investments so now now you can manage your own investment by attending webinars like this by watching a, a youtube uh, um, a video of an investment presentation by the companies that you're invested in in the past you'd you wouldn't you didn't have access to that so you simply gave your money to a big institution who would then invest it on your behalf and a lot of them say they can still do better than you can but the latest numbers to come out from S&P is for the, for the most recent year, uh, I saw it this morning, is that 60% of active managers underperformed uh, exchange traded funds in the past year. If you are investing on your own account, nobody looks after the money the way that you do, your own money. And that's really what we, uh, part of our mission at Business is to say, how can we help you to empower yourself to make your own decisions? and to make your own investments. But now you think of the pre-fourth industrial revolution, that wasn't an option that was open because you actually couldn't understand, you couldn't learn, uh, you, you didn't have access to the information that was the preserve of the few. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find companies or we look for companies that are exponential opportunities. And in South Africa, Easy Equities is one of them. It's expanded dramatically in the retail investing area. Uh, in the United States, um, the, the companies that we have in the portfolio are all exponential companies. Apple has got this more than a billion devices that keep growing every year. And you think about the, the opportunity there of putting more products into the system and you'll get a greater share of the wallet of the Apple user. We have Apple TV at home. I know in South Africa, it's not yet that popular. But as Apple grows its footprint, more people will have Apple TV. They will then uh, perhaps subscribe to that service and so on. So it's, a, it's that virtuous circle. Whereas in an industrial company, you don't have that benefit. They, they're very much 
based on incremental uh, incremental growth versus exponential and that's what we're trying to do in this portfolio so the one if you've got an opportunity if you've got the ability to grow the money that you have in the business faster by investing in the business than by paying dividends then you will continue to do that and most of these companies that we've invested in here have got that philosophy apple because it is a mature business uh, took a decision a few years ago that its share price was massively undervalued and that it would start uh, buying back shares and paying out dividends uh, amazon on the other hand has not paid a dividend in its history and uh, neither is netflix neither is shopify neither is zero uh, and be, uh, for the mere reason that they say but we're growing at 20 percent plus a year uh, when we give you the cash you can't it, it's very difficult to grow that at 20 percent a year so just leave it in the business we'll we'll manage it we'll develop and expand the business and continue on that exponential path so that's really the difference between the two Thanks, Alec. Uh, David has a question which those bigger fund managers probably have to deal with more than you, but he says if one share is outperforming its percentage allocation, should you stay in it long term or should you sell some of it and buy other shares in your portfolio to re rebalance it? David, it's a very personal thing. My view on this is that unless you have a far better option or opportunity, you should stick with what Warren Buffett says and make your average holding period forever and there are two reasons for this uh, on the one the one reason if you are really really excited about a particular share and you haven't got enough money to buy it and you need to lighten your holding somewhere or if you need income then selling a small percentage of a stock that you already own is is, is the logical thing to do warren buffett often uh, is asked this question because Berkshire Hathaway has never paid a dividend either. And he says, if you are at an advanced age and you actually need the income, then maybe sell 2% of your holding every year or 3% or whatever it is that you need. You're holding your shares in Berkshire Hathaway. And you could have the same, uh, because we will, his view is that we at Berkshire will make a better return on the money than you could ever make. So rather leave it with us. But if you actually need the income, people need to live then do it that way. The second point about all of this is, that, and it's a very important point that people often miss, is that the minute you sell a share, you trigger a tax event. And this has been one of the big, big beefs that investors, private investors have with NASPERS. Not just the fact that, and it's beyond NASPERS's control what's going on in China, um, but they've been, there've been a lot of agitation for NASPERS to unbundle its 10 cent shares. But NASPA is pushing people or making it attractive for them to trade the NASPA shares into process. Every time there's been a, a move like that, there's been a tax event. So as a consequence, you pay capital gains tax. And some people who've had NASPA for a period of time will be paying some pretty hefty bills. So just remember that anytime you sell an equity, you will be paying capital gains on it. And the best way as Buffett says, is to try and hold that when you make an investment, you make your average holding period forever. Thanks, Alec. I'm um, just, Derek says, with the current level of cash and the current tech pullback, are you not considering increasing your holding in some of the shares rather than looking elsewhere? Yes, exactly. That's exactly it as well. Uh, I do think that, uh, that both Spotify and uh, Zero are very attractive. I also really, really like to you. But I suppose uh, I'm feeling a little gun shy at the moment because it's down about 20% from our, our average purchase price. But definitely, that's the that would be the sensible way of doing it. If you are, it's it's most unlikely. And you look at this uh, graph ahead of us, and it's it's quite interesting to look at this because the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the value of the portfolio was in rands was at just under seven million rand. And as you know, now it's at 11 million rand. And that's in, what's that, uh, since February, it's at February 20 until now, call it 18 months. It has been an event that had you kept your head, you could have done very well out of the equity market. If we were to get a sell-off of tech stocks, 
of a similar type, then clearly it would make a huge, huge uh, um, sense to have that kind of investment again. Um, but the way I'm looking at the at the tech stocks, and remember, we have a commitment that we're going to start a little portfolio um, in December. So we'll start with maybe ten thousand uh, dollars as a as a new portfolio, uh, and that's um, going to be quite an interesting. Uh, I've obviously been doing quite a lot of uh, work on other companies to try and bring in maybe some different companies, but for the current portfolio, you don't want to get to December and then say, um, here are the shares that you want to buy, but oh, by the way, we've got a big cash holding. That's not really part of the whole purpose. The purpose here is to have a model portfolio that you can look at. You can either replicate it if you like, or you can look at the individual shares and then do your own homework and decide how you're going to do the balancing yourself. Thanks, Alec. Peter just wants to know, obviously the US pulled back around 5%. He says, with all the negativity and the taping, do you expect a further correction? Well, you know, the obvious part about all of this is that if you're going to create money out of thin air, then the value of assets are going to rise because the money eventually goes into those assets. So that's the general level, and it's always a uh, uh, it's always a temptation to be guided, but by what happens to the general level of equity prices. What we try to do here and what, what we try to encourage at Biz News is to get a, 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 an understanding of the underlying companies you're buying into. There's a huge uh, amount of positive press for exchange traded funds. And I can understand that if you, if you have a view that, well, I'm far too busy as a heart specialist to worry about this investment side. I'm just going to put it into exchange traded funds. Well, it's a far better approach to do that than uh, giving your money, say, to a unit trust that hasn't performed that well or an asset manager that you don't know and you don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. It could be part of some huge big institution uh, and you're just throwing the money into, into that pot. Much, much better to do an exchange traded fund. But the the philosophy we like to to promote is that nobody looks after your money as well as you do. So why not look after your money and even start small if you must. If you have a retirement portfolio of 10 million rand, well, why give all of it to the hands of somebody else to manage for you? Start off yourself with maybe half a million rand and grow it in that way. And uh, you might be pleasantly surprised at how simple it is to invest. Uh, and, and the simplicity comes from just not getting emotionally attached and really remembering that the worst thing you can do in investing is go, is, is take a grab at the golden ring and lose everything in that, uh, in that investment. Because if you can just find good long-term investments, good long-term companies, that are likely to be here, and it's got lot, lots of runway for growth uh, over the next few decades. You can do your own calculations. Have a look at my book. You can get it on Amazon on how to calculate intrinsic value. And it's, it's pretty simple then to work it out. Sometimes the numbers look ridiculous, and sometimes uh, you, you will be put off by your own calculations of what something's worth because you might lack confidence in the early stages. But in the long term, by building the skill, you will be in a position where not only do you do you outperform because no one looks after the money as well as you do, but you would also have a heck of a lot of fun doing it. This is the biggest game in the world, if you like talking about gaming earlier, is in investing in equities. But it doesn't mean you have to play every single day or every single moment of the day like many retail investors are doing in the United States. Well, I wouldn't even call them investors because they're traders. But if to, to invest, it's, it's, a, it's great fun to allocate your own portfolio and know exactly where your own money is. And I know Nassim Talib, Talib warns about that, to not look at your portfolio every day, so it'll drive you crazy because of the market volatility. Um, EJ, on the US yields, he says they're rising. Would you consider uh, any banking stocks? 
No, we haven't got banking stocks in the portfolio. We did. We had them at JP Morgan um, and Citibank uh, and Morgan Stanley in the portfolio over a period at uh, at, at one period. Um, and then they, what was concerning about them or what has to concern us now is the exponentiality of it. Um, these companies, banks will, banks have got a lot of, um, a lot of challenges. Banks are, on the on the old basis uh, linked to economic growth that's the first thing the second thing is that we've had this pandemic and we've had some insane decisions on lockdowns etc by the politicians which they they all ignore what went on in sweden where they didn't have lockdowns and sweden has done far better than most countries but of course it's politics and the politicians and and uh, vested interests have, have got their narrative and it is what it is so if you want to believe the narrative, that's fine. If you want to look past the narrative, that's also fine. But the reality on this is that banks are going to have to pick up the problems that have been caused by the issues uh, of, uh, of economic interference by, by, by um, governments. So that's, that's on the one side. The old traditional banking model, they've got some bad debts coming along. And you don't know when that's going to hit. That's the first thing. But the second thing is that there are so many challenger banks which are unbelievably good. Unbelievably good. If you give a challenger bank an opportunity, as many of the low-income South Africans did with Capitec, you can see the impact that can have to the status quo. So the banks that are going to succeed in the future are going to be the ones that have done have taken their medicine early on and they know Standard Bank's a very good example. They've done some massive restructuring within Standard Bank and quite a lot of investment into um, innovation, which that's an advantage they've got is uh, they have the muscle to make those investments. And you you um, can see maybe they will succeed, but not maybe, they're, they're positioned to succeed better than the others. But to, to make a call on that is so difficult to try and look at the marketplace and to say, is it going to be Standard Bank or First Rand or Ned Bank or APSA um, that is going to do better? Or is Capitec going to continue to eat their lunch? Or is Investec going to, uh, uh, now that it's more focused, is it going to be uh, better? Is Discovery Bank going to cause them trouble? Is Marco Jordan's new bank going to, and so on and so on. There are just so many questions. So for me, on a local front, I really uh, I wouldn't be able to call the winner. Koki Koeman can, and, uh, and and he often does. But on an international front, it's even more difficult. So uh, banks are just, it's just too tough to call. Whereas if you go to an industry where you can see that the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution are obvious for them or in that industry or for that company in the industry, I, I've been looking at crypto. Uh, my whole mind has been changed on crypto uh, because of the the libertarian kind of approach to it. And we've seen what excessive involvement by governments can do. And if if you listen to, uh, um, I did the other day, it was a two hour, a friend sent me a two hour video by uh, Jordan Peterson, who's the leading intellectual of our times uh, on uh, he, he interviewed four guys in the crypto industry. And you listen to that and suddenly you start thinking very differently about what crypto is about. But how to, how to make the right investment into it um, is, is, is so difficult that people like Pete Fulion say, look, just, just get yourself 2 or 3% in crypto. If Nuru Rabini and Charlie Munger are right and it's all a big scam and the whole thing collapses, well, that's fine then you've lost two to 3%. But if they aren't right, and if some of the others who are very smart people on the other side of the fence, uh, Elon Musk amongst them, have actually got the right insight, well, then that two to 3% could be like an Amazon in our portfolio. So there are lots of opportunities when you look at it in that way. And of course, crypto and the blockchain is going to massively disrupt banks, massively. So I'd rather go where, where the risks are lower.
Thanks, Alec. Lena just wants to know if you've looked at health stocks. No, I, I, I read a book called Empire of Pain and that stuck me off for health, health stocks forever. Sorry, it's just, uh, it's an interest, industry that, ish, I don't know. Um, I mean, just think of it on the basis of, and it's a really, really good book to read if you want to get an insight into that industry. It's all about uh, a company called Purdue Pharmaceuticals and the, and the Sackler family. Uh, and the Sacklers were uh, philanthropists. Uh, and as as one, know, well, not everybody knows this, but philanthropists give money to organizations so that they can uh, project the views of those philanthropists. They're not there to, to, to provide balance. They're provi there to provide the opinions that that particular philanthropist holds. And in the case of the Sacklers, their view was to try and make themselves a esteemed family name. And they managed to do that by buying, uh, by sponsoring um, in philanthropic ways, uh, place uh, exhibits at the Louvre, at, at uh, um, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, at the Smithsonian, at many of the universities. And it was all driven by a drug uh, that was brought into the market uh, through a very devious manner. And, and uh, so I don't, I don't know what's happening today, but what I do know is that Johnson & Johnson, which is one of our saviors, was the second biggest uh, fine on the whole opioid crisis where half a million people in America have died, which was driven to begin with by Purdue um, Pharmaceuticals, by the Sacklers. I think uh, Johnson & Johnson have just paid a $6 billion fine as a consequence of, of what they did there. And the way they got these opioids into the market in the first place, and opioids are, are made of the, they're like heroin. Um, if you start ingesting them, unfortunately, uh, you get addicted pretty quickly. Um, and they, they're sold as, as painkillers. Again, I'm, I'm really not doing justice to this book, but it's, it's well worth reading. After reading all of that, though, you and, and the way the business works and the way the doctors are incentivized and the way the FDA officials uh, can be uh, also incentivized through the company purchasing thousands of their books or giving them a speaker tours and so on. I just feel like it's an industry that you're so dirty that I'd rather not be there. Thanks, Alec. Paul's just uh, wants to know your thoughts. He says it's almost like an ESCOM situation in China, which is looks like it's targeting Apple and Tesla chip manufacturers. He's not sure if, how that would affect Apple production going forward. I know you mentioned their chips earlier. Yeah, China is, is uh, we actually had a, a piece in the newsletter this morning uh, where the Financial Times did quite a deep analysis, and I'm talking about the premium newsletter, um, which is where our spend most of my time nowadays, uh, did a deep analysis on uh, talking to Ray Dalio and uh, uh, Howard Marks and some of the other uh, top investment minds about China and what to do about China now. Um, since President Xi followed his current approach uh, of common prosperity, uh, it, it really has changed the environment uh, probably indefinitely for China. And in essence, what they've been saying is that the Chinese companies uh, shouldn't be making profits. The communists don't like companies to make profit and certainly shouldn't be making the kind of profits that a investor would like to see and that this needs to be distributed amongst the people of China. Uh, and we've seen, uh, and when Beijing calls the companies to uh, to a meeting and instructs them. It's not a, it's not a request, it's not a suggestion, it's an instruction. Uh, and in the case of uh, Tencent, for instance, after the time they were brought to the meeting, they made an, a, a donation of $7.7 .7 billion to some fund that or some uh, cause that Beijing wanted them to. And when you've got that kind of uh, situation that is prevailing, it's just very, very risky. Uh, it brings in a whole new level of risk for someone who's investing 
in a company to say nothing of the whole VIE structure where the, the shares in the companies that you're buying in China are not actually the shares in the companies in China. They are shares in a Cayman Island operation that has got a contract with that company. So it's just too complicated. And again, you know, the other people who are very smart about this and they still see China as a, a good investment opportunity. The New York Stock Exchange might have been missed by many, uh, has also issued an, a, a very strong warning, the SEC, um, sorry, not the New York Stock Exchange, the SEC, um, Security and Exchange Commission in America. And they've said that unless the Chinese companies are going to comply with American accounting standards, they will be delisted in 2024. And there's something like 150 Chinese companies that are listed in on the New York Stock Exchange. So those are the issues that, that's just so big and so complex and so complicated. Uh, investing shouldn't be. Investing should be where you find something that you, Warren Buffett says, when somebody walks through a door, you don't need to know if they're 310 pounds or 315 pounds to know they're fat. When you invest, you should be looking at something that's fat. You know it's fat. You know that there's, there's a lot of runway, there's a lot of growth that's coming for that company. You shouldn't be worried that maybe there are people around the corner who want to chop off parts of, the, uh, of their legs or arms. Uh, and, and that's the way the, the risk that has now been brought in through President Key. And I'll just leave you with one final thought there before we go to the last question. And that is, if you uh, think about this one, just, just imagine in South Africa, if Johan Rupert were to disappear from view, that the only time that anybody in the public ever heard of Johan Rupert was when he was sitting at a school in the rural areas with a one minute clip, video clip, where he says things which have obviously been pre-scripted by the government. And that's what's happened to Jack Ma, to the richest man in China. He literally has disappeared and uh, he has been well, the only thing we've heard of Jack Ma uh, in the last more than, uh, I think it's 18 months, was that one minute video clip. And that's the reality of what you're dealing with there. So if you're happy to invest in that kind of a scenario, be my guest. Thanks, Alec. There's a final question on SA investing more. Uh, Sean just wants to know what your thoughts are with regards to the distal takeover, uh, potentially by Heineken. Yeah. I, I, I... I think I know as much as, uh, as as what I've read on this one. I've got no particular inside track on that. But it is interesting that Heineken is looking at a, a, a hugely attractive business in South Africa. And there's definitely been uh, some tunadering before the proposed uh, acquisition. But uh, there's many a slip, fixed cup and lip. I remember when I ran MoneyWeb, um, we looked at a lot of propositions and quite a few of them because, and I only mentioned this because we were a public company and quite a few of them were in companies that, uh, that, that we got a long way down the, the, the road on. We issued cautionary statements, but it doesn't always mean that there's a cautionary that the uh, deal will be concluded. So if it happens, uh, it's probably going to be, well, it will be very good, doubtless, for distal shareholders uh, because they would sell out and it, it might even be very good for South Africa. Uh, but uh, it would also, well, it would be very good for South Africa because it would presumably be a massive investment into the country. But I'm not close to it. So uh, it's, it's, I would just caution that not every takeover, even those that, are, that, that they get to the point of, of giving prices, uh, are finally concluded. Although in this case, you would think that uh, given the involvement of Johan Rupert in Distel and his global, um, his global reach, that, these, that the conversations that have gone on here, um, there would have been quite a lot of consensus before they got to the point of actually doing the, the number crunching. Excellent, thanks Alec. That's all good from my side. There's no questions left.
Well, perfect. Then uh, we did the questions on uh, and exactly in time. Thanks again for joining us. It's always a privilege to be able to share this portfolio with you. Uh, we'll be back again on the last Tuesday of October. Uh, we only changed it this month because I was due to have a little break. Um, as it happened, I came back anyway, but we'd set the date of the webinar and let's just keep it that way. Uh, until then, from uh, myself, Alec Hogg, and from my colleague Stuart Lohman, cheerio. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which is compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. A recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. From our team, until the next time, cheerio.